My name is Zach Suzuka. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 21 years. Uh, I worked at McIntyre's Garden Center for most of that time. Uh, uh, at a young age, I was uh, introduced into natives and just organic gardening for my dad. And then my grandfather, uh, he was never gonna drop a dime on gardening, so it was always manure and plant. If it didn't grow, then he wasn't gonna spend any more. So that, he did organic gardening without knowing it. So uh, <laughs> that's just how he was. Like it, you know, his era was like, we're not spending any more. Um, uh, at the garden center, I, I worked all the way from the bottom, all the way to the top in the sense of uh, managing roses to the native plant section to then the whole front end, you know, uh, the retail end. Um, uh, I'm basically just amazed by botany in the sense of uh, you can attach yourself and, and witness um, uh, these systems that have, have been designed for us as humans that work perfectly long as we don't interrupt them. Um, uh, and that's usually what happens as we get in the way of, of these natural systems um, that whether it's a carbon system of replenishing soil with carbon and not taking it off the land and moving it. Or um, I've also grown in hydro uh, aquaponic systems. And then that shows you um, a nitrogen cycle. You have fish waste that goes into, and you turn that ammonia into nitrite and nitrate, uh, which the plants can then use and take out of the system. And in that you witness that system, you know, self-balancing and self-riding itself in um, and in that, that, that's what's always intrigued me about plants is uh, you can just witness this perfect machine and if we get out of its way, it, it will perform correctly. And uh, tonight we're gonna talk about, you know, how to prepare for the winter. Um, that's gonna be our, our subject. And then of course, y'all can take it wherever you want after that. Um, but how I would first start to prepare my garden for, um, the winter would be first start with mulching. Um, you want to protect the roots from cold. Um, and so usually I would probably start with about an inch and a half to no more than two inches of mulch. And we don't want to pile that mulch up on the stems because that could cause rotting. Um, and then if you have, and then we want to take inventory of any new plantings you have done in the fall. Uh, you you're gonna take precaution to make sure that those are mulched and gonna be tended to and maybe even have plans to cover them with, you know, whether it's a insulate fabric or maybe even buckets if they're small enough, if we get into the teens. Um, and another thing, you know, a lot of cities uh, tell us to turn our water off during the winter. Um, and we have to remember the buffering capabilities of water. Um, you know, you can, like in a, a location that butts up to an ocean or, or a large lake, you can see like Houston, as uh, the temperatures drop and comes into Texas, you'll see this big gulf going in about 30 miles where it is um, warmer, even as that cold front blows in because that mass of water is buffering that temperature into that land mass. So the same thing will happen as the cold, before that cold front comes, you wanna make sure you deep water all your beds, especially your new perennial beds to keep that ground temperature close to freezing or above freezing. And um, that, that will save you a lot of headache, especially with new perennials. They don't have roots deep into the ground. Um, that, that will maintain that temperature like an igloo at 32, maybe 20 degrees and versus an air temperature like last winter or i guess yeah i guess it is now um you know we had air temperature in the single digits we can hopefully keep them around 20 or somewhere in there um, uh, and the mulch will will kind of help hold that moisture and i would not water a landscape probably more than once a month if it hasn't if it hasn't rained and when i say rain you know we're looking for at least three quarters of an inch of rain if it hasn't done that and you see a, a big cold front coming 
we want to go out there, you know, three or four days before that and really drench that landscape, especially the, the perennial areas and the newer landscape. If you have established landscape, you know, they, especially in these natives, they're going, they're going to be fine. Um, but if it's been a very dry winter and you see that cold coming, I would, I would go drench them. Um, and as you're in the fall, fall, you also want to look at your inventory. If you have covers or if you're going to need to cover something up, do you have enough covers? You know, because when colds come in, the nurseries run out, you go to order it online, it's gone. Um, so you want to kind of think about what you're going to need to protect. Uh, fall is a great time to plant, but if you have a hard winter, you know, you could lose good money on, on, on stuff that you planted or even the work that you put into it. Even if you're rescuing these native plants or trading with other people, you know, that work to go to prep those beds is, uh, it, it's worth money. I mean, it's, it's, it's what hurts our back, you know, for, for doing it. Um, uh, the type of fabric, I don't know if you are familiar with it. I, I use a DeWitt, um, if DeWitt puts it out, it's called Insulate. Um, they sell other brands at different, different ratings. De, the DeWitt brand can be found at most nurseries, even Ace Hardware's. Um, it's only, it only comes in 12 foot wide sections, but you can get it at any length if you, if you find somebody that's selling off the roll. The roll is usually 250 feet long. Um, it'll hold by itself about 12 degrees. Um, um, you can, you can find it in bigger dimensions by different brands online. Uh, but you can also, as the temperature drops at night, go wet that fabric down. It is kind of a mess, but if you wet it down there again, you have that buffering capability with the wetness as it freezes on the uh, fabric and it will actually hold about another 12 degrees, giving you about 20, 24 degrees of uh, holding capability of R value. Um, and for the most part, for your native plants, I don't think you're going to be using this unless it is the first year these things have been put in, um, or you're you're pushing the bounds of a native plant that's maybe South Texas or or coastal plant like something in the mallow family um, that you're that you're you're trying to push into this area. But if you're staying Central Texas natives, once they're a year old, you're probably going to be fine. Um, uh, the next thing you would probably want to go into is uh, making sure you have enough anchor to because to weigh this stuff down uh, and usually how I anchor the fabric down is have a, a nice long pipe or landscape timber so that you have a lot of surface area that's holding it and keep it tight so it doesn't flap the more it flaps the more it's going to pull away um, and, and if you take like a, a PVC pipe and lay it down and then put bricks on top of that uh, you have that, that weight over that larger surface area. Um, instead of just having a brick here, brick here, brick here, and then that leaves area where wind can get under it and it'll start pulling away from it. Um, that's, that's the main thing on prepping for winter. Um, I was also gonna go over so soil prep for natives. You know, um, when I worked at the garden center, a lot of people would come in and say, I wanna plant natives, I prep this soil, and they're like, I've dumped a bunch of compost and done all this soil prep. And, and a lot of times then they have issues with root rot. And um, you have to kind of look at the, the native plants that you're, you're planting. You, if you're doing um, you know, something in the Edwards Plateau or Western natives, you, you may have too much clay and you may have to bring in aggregate or a limestone. Um, if you're, you're doing you know, the prairie, Blackland Prairie, you may have to add organic matter. So we have to keep that in mind. We have a lot of different regions in Texas. And when you're, you're doing native plants, you, you can't just, I'm prepping this bed for native plants. Um, you kind of have to look into what native plants you're doing uh, to prep that. And, and it may be adding compost. It may be adding elevation so you get drainage. Um, you know, I know a lot of the stuff out in, in uh, the west, west side, out where it's rocky, you know, they put them in this black land soil. We lived in Granger and it would just rot. And it didn't matter if you turned the irrigation off or not, it would just rot on you. Um, uh, so whenever, 
whenever I prep, I, I just try to keep in mind what species I'm putting in the soil and what I need to do for my landscape and how the water flows and knowing where that water is and how I'm gonna get rid of the water, if I'm gonna divert it a different way. Um, you know, those are really important things when you're planting with natives. And, uh, you know, once a native is established, you're not gonna need much irrigation, but it will need to be watered as, you, as you're trying to get it established. And uh, does anybody have any questions about winterizing or? So, Mm -hmm. And I saw those little one inch plants freeze the ice yeah. and then get covered with snow. Right. And then they were a wonderful patch of wildflowers. How did they survive? <laughs> um, well, a lot of native uh, wildflowers, they actually, if they, you know, if they're the type, you know, like blue bonnets and, and there's a lot of the gladia, they actually establish during the, the, the fall. And if they get enough, enough taproot, even a poppy, if it has enough taproot, and stem below the, the surface, it will regenerate and come back and create leaves. It, it you know, it, it doesn't need the leaf, it has it stored up in a starchy root and it will regenerate from that starchy root. Now, if it were to, like you have, if you have a dry fall and that stuff starts trying to sprout out and during a warm December day, you won't have enough starchy root and it would have taken them out. Um, you know, so it really depends on when they sprout and in Texas, you know, we can have a dry, dry fall. All our rain starts happening November, maybe right before Christmas. And that stuff then starts to sprout and, and they won't make it, you know. Uh, but, you know, the main thing is if you can get those things going, they can get that taproot down. Even if, even if you were to completely freeze that off, it's gonna come back. I've seen, I've seen them mow them down and worry like, oh man, those things all got knocked down but they will come back because they, they have enough root below the ground. Okay, you planted all those trees. Mm -hmm. And we are going to be, I hope that the phone is on the mat and there's gonna be some really cold. I'm watering them every other week, as you said. Yeah. Do I need to try to, they're mulch, because you did that. Right. Do I need to get some of that cloth to protect them, or are they going to be okay? Those, those are conifers, so I mean, they're going to be, they're, they, they could take, their biggest issue is, would be accumulation of ice or snow that could make them fall or tip. The cold is not going to hurt them. Um, and most trees, it's going to be accumulation that's going to harm them um, more than anything. Now, you, you get into the, the perennial natives, you know, you know they'll freeze, and hopefully they freeze off at the ground. Another thing that happened last year when that freeze came is you had a lot of things that had damage. And why you wanna cut that is because the stem, after that hard freeze, will start to rot because of damage. And if you don't remove that, that damage, just like if you were to you know, get gangrene or something in your foot or, or frostbite in your foot and you don't remove that tissue, it's just gonna rot and, and just keep moving down the stem like the yuccas and, and a lot of the cactus, you know, they could have been saved if it got cut and you stopped the rot. rot. Now, some of them were not cold hardy. They weren't gonna make it. They didn't, they weren't designed to take that. But um, I would say, you know, whenever you have a perennial that gets hit by cold, I would, you know, after that cold is gone, you can kind of see what's permanently dead. Go in there and remove that immediately so that, um, you know, you don't, it, at least is it not dying because, because of the rock going into the, into the ground, you know. Uh, I saw that a lot with the God is. We have to cut, the end of February, we cut our, all of our info to a perennial tree. Mm -hmm. And we cut them down. Correct. And, and, yeah, and that's, that's the other thing. In the fall, a lot of people, the first frost that hits a perennial, they want to go out there and cut it because it looks ugly. And, you know, you, you don't want to do that because we can also have, um, even after our first frost, we can have a two weeks of 78 degree weather. And that cutting uh, will actually stimulate growth. Um, so that plant will try to come back and then a harder freeze will come. And then, then you, you know, you've got to go cut that back and then it's just wearing that root system out. So allowing the, the winter to come, come and take it out. Usually if you cut after winter solstice, which would be after Christmas, 
Um, at that point, the days are as shorter they're gonna, as they're gonna be, the plant is dormant, and you're not gonna stimulate growth. And at that point, that's usually when our, our colds are gonna come in. Our coldest weather is gonna happen after Christmas. So when did you say we should do it? I would say probably after Christmas, late, late January is the ideal. Yeah. To cut back. To cut back. Mm -hmm. Does it ever freeze here hard enough to freeze below the ground? Um, not typically, but we, we, we froze a little bit of ground last year, but typically no. I mean, um, it was right at the surface, maybe an inch of soil. I mean, when you dug into the ground, it was still wet underneath the ice. But yeah, no, typically not. of 70 some odd degree if not higher uh temperatures and the ash trees at her house she um had an ash tree that uh was obviously coming back out that 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 sap froze and it caused the ash i think if that freeze would have happened probably january it wouldn't have been a big deal that sap would have still been in the ground but the fact that the trees that the mexican live oaks and the uh, ash trees they were budding out uh, even peach trees were starting to bud um, at that point. So yeah, you know, the fact that it was late and that we had had warm temperatures was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We we hit, we are far enough south and near the coast that there's a lot of birds that migrate here. They don't go any further. This this is where the and we have a lot of birds that stay here. And yes, those those stems and those seeds and um, that'll give them food that you don't have to supplement. And the best food is what's supposed to grow here, you know, because it will grow and and seed when it's supposed to. And, and you know, you know, because you can plant crops for them, but. The best thing is what the, the native cycle is. You know, that's correct. What's your philosophy on fertilization for uh, natives? I've always heard you don't fertilize them at all. Uh, I don't. You know, composting and, and, and adding to the carbon cycle uh, would be all I would ever do. You know, so uh, just just mulching. Uh, and then if, if, they're, if that soil is looking a little weak or if that, that bed is, is uh, not performing, uh, just composting, you know, um, when something's young, you could always use a liquid organic food, but I would always co cut the dose down. Like if it recommends whatever, cut that in half because, uh, you could cause that native plant to stretch, uh, which then will cause it to be prone to disease. And it basically, a uh, plant can't produce more cells when it grows fast. It just produces, it stretches the cell out, which makes it prone to insects and and fungus um, it makes the same number of cells it it just stretches them out like a like a picture of balloon over inflated um, and so that that wall is going to become thinner and um, you know insects will see that and, and then spores will land on it and just thrive you know so um, with natives just when they're young and you're trying to get them rooted before a winter or you know you're just trying to get them rooted into that ground you you might do some feeding but i'd say year to year uh, some composting and just putting mulch down. 
And uh, and a lot of mulch that we buy is what we call finished mulch. It's uh, It has no sugar left in it. So like uh, that rougher cut mulch that usually you can get from seed, uh, like cities and stuff that they shred. Yes, it's bigger cut, but you're, it's gonna be younger and still gonna have sugar in it. And that's enough to feed the microbiology of the soil and, um, and, and, and feed the plants because that sugar converts into nitrogens and, and the carbon's gonna be phosphorus, potassium, and then all the micronutrients gonna be locked up in that carbon. Like wood chips, yes. Raw wood chips is probably be the best. Um, plus then that wood chip will break down because of the different sizes. It will break down at a different rate and so it'll last longer. When you buy mulch in a uh, bag, it's it's dark brown. It's almost to the decomposing state. And, and you'll have people go, "This I have to do this every season. And it's because it's pretty much almost done and it's almost dirt by the time you're spreading it. Mm -hmm. How soon can you use that mulch? Uh, oh, well, I mean, it, it depends on if, if the tree is well established, um, you could use it right away, but, but to be safe, it's always best six months to a year. Um, six months to a year would be the safest, but if it's a big established tree and you're not going to pile it on the trunk, you could probably use it right off the bat, but just don't go thick with it and, and spread it over a large area. But to play it safe, about six months to a year. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then can I ask you one more about yep. aphids? So I planted uh, a lot of milkweed the last two years, and I haven't been inundated with aphids, millions of them. Yeah. Do I leave them? Yes. Um, I mean, if you want to control them, yeah. because uh, the aphids are actually a part of the of of that that system. Right. The male will. Um, and the female will take the honeydew from that aphid and give it energy to migrate north or south. Um, now you can control them like on a young plant with you know a soapy water or even like a rubbing alcohol that you can just brush on them and try to control the population uh, because you, you definitely want to stay away from anything that's going to have a residue for for your larva you know even if it's a contact kill you know um, even with your soap, if you have larva, I'm very hesitant to, to go out there because the soap, you know, it, it, you know, it can chemically do stuff to those larva. You told me that they're very beneficial. Yeah. I was asking you about that on some of my neighbors, and you said, leave them. They're part of the whole system. Yeah. Yeah, and if you so kill all the leave. aphids, you're, you know, you're not giving your ladybugs a food source. And so you're, you're, you're kind of getting rid of what would naturally control the aphids? You I've know. been looking for ladybugs and I don't see any. I just see millions of aphids. And yeah. they're up, stem everywhere. I mean, it's just unbelievable. I've never had them before. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's pretty typical. But but if you just take some soapy, you know, and try to get a natural soap, and then you can also buy like a soapy spray that's just a fatty acid, and it, it'll kill them, you know. And, and you can like just attack like a quarter of the plant right. at a time, you know, if you're. And really, once the plant's established, it's not going to kill that plant. Okay. I mean, you're talking about a plant that was meant to be chewed on. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, once they're established, they're going to be fine. Well, they're not on anything else. Yeah. And, and aphids are, are um, interesting because they are, those orange aphids will only go to milkweed. Uh, they won't go to a crepe myrtle. Now, crepe myrtle will have a green or brown aphid, um, but that orange one will only go to oleander and to milkweed, which are both toxic. Um, you know, so, you know, they're, and your ants aren't helping you. You'll notice the ants will, will harvest the aphids. They'll actually take the aphids under the ground and uh, stash them away like in a barn. And then in the spring, bring them back out and place them to, to harvest the honeydew. They milk them like a cow. Um, well, yeah. Well, they work together, you know, because they protect the, the aphid from ladybugs. They'll attack the ladybug larva and stuff like that. Um, when I had artichokes, you had aphids by the barrel. Yeah. Well, but a different kind. Yeah. And then the ants will go on their Yes, and that, that, that's usually a good sign that you have aphids or some kind of mite is you'll start seeing ants go up and down. And people are like, ants are killing my stuff. And it's not ants. It's, you know, you've... And, 
you've got insects that they're harvesting off of, you know. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Bugs Life, but the, the queen is holding an aphid in, in her arm. And, you know, that's, that's, what, they, that's what that symbolizes. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I planted about an acre of blue bonnets. And yeah. I'm really hoping that I get something. Is there something that I should be doing now other than hoping they sprout? Um, you know, at this point, I, I wouldn't water. You know, the best thing you can do when you, you plant them in the fall is try to give them a lot of water. Right. Uh, but at this point, I, you'd probably just harm any ones that have sprouted. You could flood them out. Okay. Um, and the hardest part about getting a, a blue bonnet patch is the first seeding. Um, and people that are trying to do it, I, I always recommend it to seed in the fall, seed um, November, so like October, November, hit it twice that year, and then a last hurrah, but you'll need to definitely uh, make sure that area is cultivated. Right. Uh, like late January, February, seed some stuff directly in the ground. Oh, okay. uh, because if you can start your own uh, seed bank even if you just get a few to sprout you're better you're gonna have better success at sprouting them because uh blue bonnets are a legume and they they have to be inoculated with a good uh, a beneficial bacteria uh, that grows with the root system and the, that will happen better in in the soil as it establishes its own seed bank and so yeah it's a slow process and um, and also when it, whenever you have blue uh, the blue bonnet you know let them look almost ridiculous before you mow them. You know, I've, my, you know, you want it to look ugly and it almost hurts to, to look at it because you want that seed to sit in the sun and scarify that seed. It needs to sit in the sun and bake uh, in that Texas sun. Uh, most people will mow them as soon as they get, look brown and ugly and that, that's probably the worst mistake. My uncle had five acres of blue bonnets because they had cleared all the cedar off this land and uh, we went out there for Easter and it was just almost five acres solid of, of blue bonnets. Well, it started looking ugly and he took the shredder out there and I was like, what did you do? You know, <laughs> I got all over him. He's like, oh, it'll be fine. The next year, they still had some, but it was not not near as much. The Gallardia was taking over, the Indian blanket and stuff was taking over. Talking blue bonnets. Um, my blue bonnets have kind of undergone some crazy so there's a lot of leaves out there right now. Yeah. Should I leave those leaves or should I go and mow those leaves? How, how thick is the leaf matter? It's not thick. Yeah. It's just a lot of them. I, I would probably let it be. Um, and if you did anything, I would probably lightly rake. You know, um, I, I wouldn't probably pay someone to do it. They'd get, probably get a little too frisky with it and... and you know, they could like just pull some young plants that out. Uh, they'll make, if they have seeds, they're gonna come through it, you know, as um, long as there's enough light, you know. And then w when you're establishing those, I would probably take whoever's cutting them back, point that weed whacker so it's throwing them out into the sun, you know. Well, they are migrating. The plants yeah. Here, here, here. Yeah, yeah. Here. That's the goal is that you're always pushing them further and further out, you know, and, and spreading that area. And, and that's the easiest way to get keep, keep blue bonnets is once you have a patch is, is don't don't mow too early you know I've, I've seen people ruin perfect patches you know by going too early if we yeah uh, yes if if probably not a lot at this point but if, if we go a month without rain water and, and look for little juvenile plants, um, uh, which would be about that big. You would have the little clo the clove leaf, the, the uh, premature leaf, and then you'd have the uh, maybe the first little sets of, of fan leaves at this point. There wouldn't be much. All they're doing is growing roots at this point. Um, that's all that's happening. So and you're it, saying I should be able to see something out there? There should be something growing. Okay. Uh, but blue bonnet seeds can sit two to three years there, you know, unlike, they can sit in a seed bank a long time, which is why you can have really bad blue bonnet ears, really bad, and then there'll be one year that just the rain is perfect, everything works out, and then it's just like, all the roadsides are just covered, 
you know, because the, the seed is very hardy, uh, very thick, and, and it's like a little pebble of rock. You saw them, you know. Right. Um, and when they're raw blue bonnet seeds, they're even hardier. You know, they haven't been soaked in an acid or anything like that. Very late into our. Yeah. Pouring out all my stuff. Yeah. Uh, I also have Dr. Earth that has mycorrhiza in it. Yes. Do you like anything in particular? What do you use? Uh, mycorrhiza. You, I, you can see night and day of using it. Um, now, when you're trying to use it with native plants, uh, you do want to try to cultivate a native mycorrhiza, and that's something you cannot buy in a, a store. Uh, but for a transplant, it's great. And the, uh, so that's say, um, like if you go into the, it's, it's a beneficial bacteria, or um, mycorrhiza grows with the root system of a plant. Um, so it attaches itself to the root system and will help absorb nutrients that the plant can't naturally absorb. Um, like a plant can't absorb most of the nutrient it needs. It, it, it can do phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, and nitrogen, without nitrogen, none of those elements can move into the plant because they're, they're too heavy. Nitrogen is unstable, and so it picks up those, those heavier elements and take them into the plant. So mycorrhizae allows, you know, harder to absorb nutrients to absorb into the plant and also opens the surface area for absorption of water. Uh, and these things exist everywhere, but, but they, a lot of people package uh, mycorrhizae up in a liquid or in a powder that you can mix into your soil when you transplant or you can spray it over the entire landscape. Uh, but how I would culture a native one, you would take leaf mold from, go underneath an old oak that's in a field and just pull that leaf mold. And when you start seeing white fuzzy, you know, microbiology growing, take that and then put that into a compost, de, uh, compost tea, which is basically just gonna be molasses. And then you're gonna culture that, that into that brew and then you can you can sustain that long as you keep your brew. You can spray it into compost pile, and then every time, long as you just like a sourdough, long as you never use that whole compost pile, you can keep that going. Now, and what I like about the native is that it's going to be used to the temperatures and the water and and how how things grow. If you take some culture from California, well, it does great there. You know where they have their high temperature is you know, in 95 and, you know, you know, it doesn't get very cold in Southern California. Well, we get cold and we get hot and we get really long dry periods. They get the dry periods, but you know, it's same thing from Oregon, you know, um, like ocean forest is a um, Fox farm makes all their soils have mycorrhizae in it, but you know, they're based out of Northern California and Oregon, you know, Yes, it'll live, but as soon as our environment changes, it's, it's probably gonna die and not come back. So I, I would look for your own native source, you know, and try to cultivate that. And if somebody's making compost tea, you know, in a, in a, a group like this, you could share that, you know, uh, even just bring it to the meeting or meet up and, and, and hey, you know, we're giving this away. Um, when I worked at the garden center, I, I was always the one making the compost tea and it was always a part of the compost tea. It, it was more important than the vermicompost itself, you know, and the compost is more about the beneficial bacteria so we can absorb the nutrients efficiently. You know, efficiency is more, better than uh, adding adding nutrients, especially for natives. I was reading the book from the 40s by a British guy, it's called Agricultural Testament, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was right when uh, commercial fertilizers were, artificial fertilizers were starting to be manufactured. And he's for the team of people and his fields that he was analyzing were in India and Africa. And he swore that you could make all this wonderful compost just from a team of oxen to fertilize all Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if anybody here is, you know, knows Joel Salatin and Joel Salatin's work, um, but he's in, basically, uh, I look up to him a lot. He's part of uh, permaculture and and he talks about uh, the carbon cycle and and everything's built out of carbon and if 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 we did agriculture the way it 
you know, the, the plains were designed, you know, you wouldn't have an overgrowth of a Western cedar, you know, because when they had bison that would run through by the X amount of million and they would devastate a landscape after, you would look at it and you'd look like there was a blast, you know, that happened. Um, but that's a disturbance and that's naturally supposed, and as they run through there, they're depositing that manure and they prune all the, the woody plants down and, and that's where the prairies have gone. We don't, we have fences and, it, and, and we don't, we don't uh, put herbivores in big tight groups. They just open them up to 600 acres and they eat whatever they eat and then we haul in hay. Um, and that's exactly right. The carbon cycle is, is the number one thing you can do for your soil is bring in carbon. Uh, you see a big pile of wood chippings. I mean, if you're trying to grow plants, that's, that's like gold. You know, um, uh, composting is, is the, the number one thing I would do, you know. So we can go over here at Melton and get a pickup load for like $6. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is, and you can age it or use it as is, you know, um, and it, but, but, but $6 is cheap, you know, and, and, and a lot of cities, like if you're like in Georgetown, they'll give you X amount of yards for free, you know, if you're in the city limits. Um, so there's a lot of sources or if people are chipping up trees like down power lines, a lot of times you knock on, talk to one of them, say, hey, dump that over here. Because they have to pay to dump it, you know. Say Saladin's name again. Joel Salatin. Salatin. Mm -hmm. Yes. In Killeen, I know they are. And I don't know about up here, but yes. Yes. And the only thing you have to be careful with uh, the environmental, um, you know, di you know, entities of government is if you get several piles piled up and they sit there, they'll try to classify you as a dump. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so you have to be careful how long it sits and where it sits. Um, now it makes no sense. It's carbon. It's not like you're, you know, putting baby diapers in a big pile out there. Um, it's just carbon. It's not even gonna have a smell, you know. Um, but but that has happened to a couple of people that that were, they were piling up and aging stuff, and that can happen. But I think if you, you know, don't let it sit there forever, and you don't have a neighbor going crazy about it, you know, you'll be fine. My pile of baby diapers is my chickens. I, I take their the hay. Yeah. From and I made a mulch pile for the first time this year and within a month it was black soil. Yes, and, and if, if if it ever smells, that's what that wood, that carbon will be like a diaper. It, it'll absorb it, absorb the moisture, and you can get, get rid of that smell by just adding more carbon to that pile. So like, like a lot of times, hay, it's gonna have a lot more nitrogen. Like when you're composting, there's a nitrogen and a carbon, and you need to balance that ratio to one to one. Yeah, leaves. With chicken manure, you're going to have more issues with having uh, it, it had being too foul, too much ammonia. So having an, a, an extra pile of carbon that you can put in there, uh, plus that, that gives you more biomass to break down that turns into stuff you can spread out all over the place. And then they also suggest that ashes in there too. Yeah, just be careful with ashes because it'll it could stop the decomposing, you know, and it's going to be alkaline. So that's going to you know, you want a semi-acidic environment. So just not too much ash, you know. But but it, it is, a, charcoal and ash is good in the sense of you'll have a lot of minerals that are ready to absorb. Um, like uh, on her peach trees, we use azomite um, and, uh, and lava sand and green sand for minerals. Because um, there's been some uh, disease issues and we're trying to just boost the, um, minerals that those plants are getting, trying to boost the cell walls and, and make them more hardy. Where are you finding green sand? Every time I've got to find it, they say they're pits, they're pits in Yeah, they, they, they're relabeling it. And, um, you know, I think Gardenville found a new pit. It's more red. There's, you know, but the main thing is that it has iron, you know, iron and basalt in it. So the pits aren't coming out as green. So they can't, they're basically going to have to relabel the bags. and. But they have found new pits of, of what would be the equivalent of, of green sand. And uh, I think that's, where did, we got that at uh, the place in Round Rock, Round Rock Gardens, the green sand? Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, which is a little bit more of a drive, but, but we couldn't find it in Georgetown, uh, but they still had half a pallet when, we were, when I picked up that. Yeah, and uh, there's a place out of somewhere near Fort Worth that you can get it in bulk. And one time I actually went in with the guy, his parents lived up there and they hauled some down and we just split the batch because we lived in Granger, that clay soil. Uh, we always would dump that green sand in there. And usually McIntyre's did, does have green sand, but they were just out at that moment. Uh, getting it from a company out of San Antonio. Uh, nature's creation, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Your talk about cross covering or protecting plants with some sort of covering. Do you constantly take it off, put it back on, take it off, put it back on? What's the rule in how long you can leave it on? If, if you use a white covering, it'll allow sunlight through. Um, and for me, if, if there's going to be another cold front within a week or two, I'll leave it on just so that I'm not going to mess up and be busy with life and not get it back on. Um, because, you know, all it takes is one evening that you go over to someone's house and you're like, oh, that thing's coming in. And, and it's not easy to do, you know, when, it, when it's dark and the wind's blowing. So the light can come through it. So the plants aren't going to completely suffocate with it. Like, like plastic, you know, in the sun, it'll just bake. It'll make like an oven in there. Uh, this thing does breathe to some degree, and uh, you're not going to rot your plants off with it. Okay. So I, I would say leave it on. If they're talking, you know, in a week or two, that there's another cold front, just leave it on. Just so that you're not playing that game. Hot. Yeah, they're not going to get too hot. Um, I've got a question for Katie. Mm -hmm. Katie, you said that you Uh, the, yeah. Are any of those things that Katie produces here, and are any of those good for our gardens? Uh, yes, they're, you know, they've probably extracted most of the sugar, uh, but you're going to have good surface area to grow good bacteria. It could go into a, um, into a compost pile. Um, I know a guy in Georgetown makes soap out of it. Um, but as for gardening, yeah, I mean, you have that, that, that hole has still got calcium and lots of nutrients in it. So it could go into a com compost pile. Uh, you could even just incorporate it into the soil. Uh, they've extracted most of the sugar out to, to get the alcohol and convert that sugar into alcohol. So most of the easy like nitrogen and stuff is gone, but, but you still got that carbon that's there that you could compost down. Mm -hmm. Leftovers, I don't know what you're talking about. And then we have, um, when we, after we boil it, we have um, at the bottom of the wart, like there's um, like liquefied pots, mm -hmm. really thick stuff um, that we're not going to transfer over to ferment with the beer. Yeah, and you um, got the dead yeast too. Um. No. Yeah. And so that's something too, because could I take that old yeast and... Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, because, yeah, it could go into a compost pile and it would kick it up a notch, you know. Um, it's not going to harm anything. Okay. What I'm really interested in is the, the pop matter, like the liquefied pop matter. Yeah. Can I put that in? Yeah, you could probably use that just, just as is, you know. If, if you were concerned, you could probably, you know, go by half by volume, half water, half that, just just to make sure you're not overcooking anything, you know, in the sense of nitrogen. You, your concern there would be nitrogen with hops. Would it be a tea? Would huh? it be yeah, you you could let you could let it sit, or you could make it a part of the compost tea. Just when you're brewing a batch of compost tea, just put put some some of that in there, you know, and. And then let it, you know, compost. It'll compost in that bucket. 
you know, uh, and break it down and dilute down how much nitrogen is in there. Uh, I usually do about a pound, pound and a half of uh, worm castings, and then I will do about quarter pound of some kind of organic-based, uh, meal-based fertilizer. Um, I've been using the uh, Happy Frog, you know, because it has about 15 beneficial bacteria in it, and then I'll do an ounce of molasses to every gallon that I'm making up. And uh, the more you can aerate it, the better. Uh, you can do it in a bucket with just stirring it every so often, but uh, you will get a little bit more foul smell because you'll have anaerobic bacteria going on as well. But the more it aerates, it actually should be sweet, a sweet smell. It's water. All that goes into X amount of, X amount of, like it just depends. Like, so you're going to add an ounce of molasses to every gallon and then uh, about a pound, pound and a half of worm castings for every gallon. Of water. Yeah, if you got well water or rainwater, you know, that's not going to be chlorinated, that's going to be best. And if you have chlorinated water, you can let it sit out. If they use chloramine, good luck uh, because the chloramine lasts a really long time. And as these cities get stretched out, they're using chloramine because they can't put a treatment, they can't put that many treatment centers in. So they use chloramine and that, that stuff won't off gas as fast. Best thing is just well water or rainwater if you, if you have a source. Anybody else have any questions? I do. Yeah. So you've talked about cover your plants before the first freeze and I was neglectful and I've got some hibiscus twisted root trees, decorative, yeah. that look horrible. Yeah. I've now started covering them, but I think it's the cart before the horse. Are they yeah, the um, I would probably just pull the leaves off if they're still attached and then take your fingernail and just scratch the stem. If it's still green, uh, you're probably good. If it's gray or brown, you've probably lost it, but it, you know, it might come back from below, but you've lost your braid and all the stuff that you bought. You know, when you buy those things, that's what you're buying. Because you, know, you can buy a gallon hibiscus anywhere, but that braid is what you're trying to preserve. Yeah, and if you have to leave them outside, I would probably wrap the fabric around that stem uh, and go up and then around, you know, trying to preserve that, that stem best with, with those, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, Asian varieties of hibiscus, you know, just probably bring them into a greenhouse or, or something like that. Yeah, I was trying to convince my husband they belong in the garage, but he wasn't going. Well, it's never fun to haul stuff in. <laughs> it never is. It's always hard. So I've been trying to grow milkweeds, and they're so hard to grow. Um, so what do I do when I have milkweeds that are not going to last long? Which one? The tropical milkweed or like uh, antelope horn? Or antelope horn. That one is very, very hard. So you need to uh, take that seed and you got to stratify it, which you've got to uh, uh, get some vermiculite. And, uh, I've got it one-to-one -one with vermiculite and perlite. Yeah, and then moisture. put that in the refrigerator for six to eight weeks and then take the seeds out and try to sprout it. But even that, you know, I have found it's easiest if you ever find a field that they're naturally sprouting is just go get them from the field and move them. And, um, and then when you transplant them, make sure that that ground is draining a lot like where you, they're going to usually grow on, on gradual slopes with an uh, aggregate, you know, uh, in, in that ground or even sandy loam is where they're going to grow. Um, they, you know, it's weird. Like you can go to one field and they won't be there, but you'll go to another next field and they'll just be covered. And if you dig it up, it's usually the difference of soil. You know, one will be black and they won't grow there, but you, you go over here and there's either aggregate, some kind of, you know, some kind of limestone or even just sandy loam got pushed in there. You yeah, know. I get a grant for the last two years of 200 milkweed and I try to plant yeah. them separately at the very beginning. At the garden center, we would do that. Uh, we would get about 
15% success under a controlled environment. And then when we would go to buy them, they would wholesale at $19. And we found out why, because the success, you know, a commercial grower, 15% success is they're looking for, they don't even like 50%. I mean, they want to have 98% success when they're propagating. And, um, Come up, I've had zazotis come up on my land by itself. Yeah. And love corn by itself. Yeah. It's just really hard trying to do it yourself. Yeah, and, and I found the ones that you sprout aren't as hardy as when they just naturally come up. It's right. it's the establishment of that taproot. Uh, when they're young and this big doing nothing, they're they're establishing a big taproot. Yeah. Well, I have had some come back. Yeah. Not many. But yeah. I mean, you're, you're trying, and, and I would just try to promote them spreading. So every pod you collect, spread some, you know. I have some in the refrigerator, some of the spread. Yeah. We hate to interrupt, but I know he's got a, we've got a business meeting. I want to say something about the milkweeds. You want to look where there is a for sale sign uh, right here in Tempo, between Belton and Tempo on Midway on the side. And I found all these Isotas and Texas cup grass that you really don't see very often. And I think it was sold once. And then the lady came by and wanted to know what I was doing. I said, well, I'm rescuing these rare milkweeds for the farmers. And I said, is that okay? She said, yes. And they were gonna, but it's now reposted for sale because they didn't want the whole 60 acres or how much it was. And now they started mowing it. Oh man. The last two years. So it's real hard to, the cup grass is not so hard for me to identify, but the Cizotis milkweed, but I got a lot of them. I gave some away. Uh, I bet you I rescued 30 of those milkweeds. Yeah. So that's, what, but you need a sharpshooter. Yep. You need a very, I mean, the roots grow this far. Yeah, and you, and you don't want to break them because uh, cause it'll, it'll cause a wound below the ground and it'll tend to rot that big tuberous root, you know. So if you can try not to break them. And if you, if you are gonna dig them, you know, earlier on, so they have a lot of time to recover before it gets hot, you know. That's, you know. I did have good luck with them. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. They seem to transplant a lot better than the antelope horns. Yeah. But I have a lot of antelope horns on my property, and and I have green milkweed. Yeah. And then Monarch Watch told me, oh, I couldn't have green milkweed plants in this grand because they don't grow west of I-35, and mm -hmm. I'm west of I-35, and I have beautiful green milkweeds in the lower part. Well, there's things that prove professionals otherwise many times. I don't want anything this year. I have enough, I have 400, and I, it's a hard time, I mean, you have a hard time taking care of them. And the KR blue stem is, you know, they it spread so bad, it takes everything over. Yeah. Well, it's really it won't allow anything it. to get through that canopy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We really appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank y'all. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Watch. If you haven't given us your email, please do, because I'll let you know the minute this stuff is up. We'll start passing the word. Do we have some new members?